Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. Um, I'm glad to be in this, uh, this webinar. And um, I also like to stand on uh, existing protocols. Uh, let me firstly thank the organizer um, of Nigeria for this uh, uh, invitation. And I'm so glad to, to present. It's always exciting for me to talk about um, rice in Nigeria which has really been my focus for almost 20 years. And um, I think today we have an interesting um, presentation on the update on the um, newest rice uh, project, which we have been running since 2008. Um, this is just a, a show of what my presentation is going to look like. It's good to talk a little about the rice production in Nigeria, uh, the, the consumption and um, even the, the deficit. Um, also the major uh, problems that exist, uh, also the intervention that we're doing and uh, where we are and I just conclude with that. So when we look at the background, um, rice is the fastest growing um, source of calorie in Africa. And um, what is making this to shift is the consumer preference and the easiness of um, preparation of, of which rice is easy to prepare. So that is making a lot of young people, even in East Africa and other parts, to consume rice. So um, the production is, um, is has a lot of deficit. And um, due, to the, to, due to different um, abiotic stress in Africa. So this is just an overview of what is happening in Africa. So when we talk of rice um, production in Africa, I try to do this so that we can see how important it is because rice is a, is a crop of strategic importance. I try to go down to the lane where there was a scarcity of rice in 2008. And that tells us that importation of rice to Africa is not sustainable uh, and it's not a good way to get ourselves uh, food sufficiency in Africa, so or food security. As a result of that, we have um, the, the, the this graph tells us about what is this. When you look at the green part, is the consumption. The consumption keep going up at a rate higher than uh, six percent per annum across Africa. And when you look at the um, the production, which is the blue part, is though it's going up, but it is yet to meet the consumption, which is extremely high. And that led to the deficit that we have. And we cover that by importation, which is the uh, brick red color, which we have there. So it has been projected that by 2026, 20, the importation will rise to 15.4 million metric tons. Currently, we are at about 12 million metric tons of importation to Africa. But if we don't do something drastic by 2026, that importation will rise up to 15 million metric tons of rice. And that is, that's, that is going to be quantified at close to about 10 billion um, USD. Rice is a very important crop in, in Nigeria and is the leading, is one of the leading staples in Nigeria. Maybe when we are talking of series, maybe after rice and wheat is the next or consume across in different forms. You can see these different meals that we have from Nigeria. Here, you have the jollof rice, which is the popular Nigerian jollof rice. You have the white rice and, and uh, dododia, which you call the plantain chips. And you have the fried rice. You have the rice and beans, which shows that when the cowpea presented, um, these things are interrelated. It shows that this complements food and nutrition security, not just about food security alone. We are thinking about nutrition security. And you go to our own popular or father rice, which is popular in Nigeria. When you go far north, you talk of two uh, shinkafi, which people consume a lot. Um, it's a, a, one interesting thing that we have to understand is Nigeria is the largest producer of rice in Africa. And despite the fact that Nigeria is the largest uh, producer of rice, there is still a very huge cap in the rice production. We have about 1.6 million metric ton deficit currently, despite all the effort of government 
which you're going to see very soon in, in ensuring that this uh, gap is built. So Nigeria um, was rated as the larger, largest importer in sub-Saharan Africa. We import about 20% of the rice that is imported to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, when you look at the production, try to give these um, government have done a lot to discourage importation and thus they have encouraged uh, production. And because production has been encouraged, there has been an increase in, the pro in, 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 in rice production. And this increase has been due to um, increase in, in, I mean, in land area that is harvested. Actually, that is not sustainable because it does not give good value for the cost of production. And also, um, this, has, this the deficit we have now, which is about 1.6 uh, million metric ton per annum, are uh, reduced from 2.7, which it was in 2014, which as a result of the, um, the, the, the government closing the border, uh, discouraging importation, this has made farmers to produce more. But the production has not been as a result of increase in yield or productivity, but it's as a result of uh, increase in land area. You can see from this graph, you can see the way uh, the domestic consumption is going up, and you can see this is Nigeria uh, situation. You can see how the production is also increasing, but the production is still struggling, and it's yet to meet up with the consumption, which also keep going up. When you look at it, you look at the, the deficit. Because of the effort of the government, this, the deficits drop. But despite that drop, we are still at 1.6 million metric tons, which amounts to about 480 million USD and about 184.7 billion Naira. That's a huge amount of forex that could come to our farmers that is going outside Nigeria. Either the government closed the border or not, this is the deficit we have. Now, um, in terms of yield, yield is a very important factor. Actually, it's the beginning of the discussion when we are talking about improvement of rice, uh, I mean, improvement of food security as a result of rice in Nigeria. So the average yield is lower than the global yield and lower than that of Asia. When you look at Nigeria, the average yield is at 2.3 million met uh, 2.3 metric tons per hectare. And in Asia, they are already at about five um, average of five uh, metric ton per hectare, and globally it's about 4.6 uh, metric tons per hectare. So, um, the, for local rice to actually economically compete, and also um, in terms of productivity and quality, there's a need to work and improve on those two areas, the productivity and the quality, so that the cost of production will go down and the quality will also improve. Those two areas are very important if we want our local rice to actually compete with uh, imported rice. Now I try to talk about what are the basic challenges that happens that has made our, our yield not to be able to make up with, uh, with, uh, with, with the global one. The reason, one of the basic reasons is, is because rice is grown in different ecosystems. Um, and you have rice under upland condition, under the hydromorphic uh, land, the, in, under that uh, gradient. You have the lowland, you have the soil irrigated. And when you talk about the irrigated, which shows to supplement the water that you need for rice. When you look at the upland, which is the majority uh, rice, for major rice production area in Nigeria, you have drought, which is a very big issue because it's, rain bed depend it's dependent on rainfall. You have the nitrogen use, of, uh, nitrogen deficiency. Every year, the soil depletes itself of nitrogen because of a lot of factors that happen. You have other factors under lowland also, which is also, uh, I mean, hydromorphic and lowland, which is also rainfall. You have nitrogen deficiency also across. So nitrogen deficiency is across. If we can address it, then we can address a lot of issues. So salinity is also a problem. Despite the fact that we have nitrogen deficiency, I can still assure you that farmers still struggle with having money to buy the fertilizer to be able to augment the nutrient content of the soil. And that is why this project is very important. So as AATF, we are empowering small, small older farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa with agricultural innovations that can generate wealth and health for their families, communities, and countries. If we're interested in farmers, we have to be interested in their well-being, in their wealth, and in their health. 
So that's very important. And how we do it, we want them to be prosperous and we want Africa to be food secure. If Africa is going to be food secure, then motivation must be given to farmers by improving their production culture. Uh, we, we, are, we are interested in transforming their livelihood at ATF. So an African continent that has rapid access to the state of art technology um, should be leading in food, food and nutrition security, and we need to increase income benefits. That's just it about ATM and values that we look at. We look at integrity, dedication, and accessibility. Then we must have access to every single technology that is available, just like my predecessors have said. Now, we look at what is our intervention in this area. We have look, identified those basic things, the draft, nitrogen deficiency, salinity, which is becoming pre predominant in, a, in some part of, of, of Africa now, especially in the worry as it's going towards Abakaliki, salinity is becoming a very big issue. So we need to address that. So the objective of the, so we develop what we call nitrogen use efficient, water use efficient and salt tolerance rice, which is meant to address those uh, things. And the objective is to uh, develop a locally adapted rice variety and put that gene into the popular varieties that are being grown in, uh, in the different countries. An example of where we are planning to put is Faro 44 in Nigeria, which most farmers grow all around. We have two product pipelines, and um, the two pro product pipelines are the nitrogen use, efe use efficient pathway, which is going to take care of the nitrogen deficiency in, in under upland condition and under lowland condition, especially under rain-fed condition where it is predominant and also the nitrogen use efficient, water use efficient, and salt tolerant, which is a triple star. We brought all the three genes together to develop that. How was this, this de developed? So we have this specific target for, for this project. So we develop traits that can mitigate and affect and affect the effect of a climate change. It can mitigate it. And not just that it, 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 it mitigates it, that also allows sustainable yield under low input condition, because that's a very big challenge to the farmers in, uh, in Nigeria. They have the resources to have access to our input. So uh, we have the nitrogen use efficient, the water use efficient, and the salt tolerance. So uh, the technology, a lot of concern has always been that the purpose of, uh, of, of these technologies is that the Western world want to use it to exploit us and let us depend on them. This technology is, is gotten um, it's, it's, it's reality free for humanitarian focus just to help the African farmer. And I can assure you, this is the product of this technology is owned by the uh, by ATF, and every product developed in the in each country is owned by that country by the developer in that country. So that remove that fear that people have. So also this the jam plasm that was used is a jam plasm that was developed in Africa. So it has an African genetic background. Nerica, new rice for Africa, developed by Africa Rice. And uh, this is the product that was transformed. It's a popular pro uh, product in Africa. And the breeding material um, is in the public domain. It's, it's, it's a public product of, uh, of Africa rice. So, and uh, the improved performance, uh, this gene will be put into whatever farmers uh, prefer to produce in each country. So it's gonna be owned by, by the people. This is the process we use. I'm not gonna bore you with the details of this uh, scientific uh, um, work. But what is clear is that we have developed 15 um, uh, NUE lines, and then we have developed 20 um, triple stack, which have the three genes lines. And we have thousands of them, but we have streamlined those ones. Uh, the process that led to that, we have talked a lot about science, but I'm not just going to tell us much. We, the Nerica that was transformed was a cross that was made between Africa, the, the rice that originated from Africa and cultivated rice that originated from Asia, which gave us what we call new rice for Africa. And Nerica is, is, Nigeria is part of the development of Nerica as part of Africa rice. And this Nerica, what we just did is that to, to put the gene responsible for nitrogen use efficient, water use efficient, and salt tolerance into it. And when this was done, we have the newest rice and we have the NUE pipeline. So when we, after this, we, in, we are introducing this back into the varieties that farmers preferred. So the end product is going to be farmers preferred 
newest rice. If we introgress it into Faro 44, it's going to be newest Faro 44, which Amath is already cultivating. So what is the mechanism that, that this system uses? What it does is that it, it improves this, the rooting capacity of the, of the plant so that it has a lot of surface to be able to absorb the nitrogen in the soil, the nutrient that makes the plant to be able to give you better yields. So that is what it, this diagram is just telling you. You can just see the wild, when you see the wild type, it means the non-transformed Nerica. This is what the root structure look like. And when you, when you use the one that has been transformed, you can see the, the increase in the root quantity, which make it to absorb more nutrients. So this is the way it works. When you apply your nitrogen fertilizer to the soil, 70% of what you apply is lost, either by evapotranspiration or by leaching. Only 30% goes to the root of the plant. What, that, what the NUE tried to do is to reverse and let the plant, the, because of the increase in the root, to be able to absorb this thing from the surface of the soil, it turns it around and uh, bring that to 70%. So the, what the plant absorbs is 70%. What is leached is just um, 30%. That's exactly what that technology does. And in doing that, we have carried out a number of confined field trials. Like my other colleagues have said, we do confined field trials. We, we carry out the confined field trial on the 15 um, events, uh, on, I mean, on the 15 um, NU events. And we have we selected uh, an NUE 12 as the lead event, which performed very well across board in Uganda, in Nigeria, and uh, in, in Ghana, which are the project uh, countries. So NUE 9 is the selected as the safety backup. So our trial is going on in Ghana, in, in Ghana, in one place, in Kumasi, in Nigeria, Badegi, and uh, also more. And uh, in Uganda. So, and you can see the yield we are having. So, when we look at that result, we, the target that we have and which we thought is going to be of economic benefit is by having um, at least 10% increase in yield. Sorry about that. I have to go back one step. It's about having 10% yield increase. But the lead event and the second to lead event is getting about 17 and 20% uh, yield increase. You can see the basic uh, the, the data there it speaks for itself. And um, in that process, we have identified the lead event, which is the lead product, which we are now putting under regulatory trial so that we can have a data that we submit to National Biosafety Management Agency for confirmation of environmental release so that we can be able to make this available to farm for production and we can go for national performance trials and on-farm trials. So we have, we have concluded the first season of the regulatory trials and then we, are, we, are, we have collected samples that is needed for different compositional analysis and other analysis that needed to be done and also we are, or we are to con continue with the second regulatory trial in the four locations that I've earlier mentioned, Mokwa, Badegi, and uh, uh, Kumasi, and uh, uh, Namulonge in Uganda. And the reason why we are bringing the data of all those other countries that to be sure that we capture different ecology, ecological zones that can be represented, considering the cost of having a confined field trial. So, um, Sylvester actually talked about safety. This is very important. And we have carried out safety on all the genes that have been that have been introgressing to this, and all the results of that of their safety have been submitted for approval. And uh, by the time we are we are compiling the dossier for um, National Bio Safety Management Agency, all this will be included in it. It's just a proof that the 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 the, the alerts have been proved that is safe. The ATIPT, which have been used widely for um, for, 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 for development of product of, across the world for years is saved and FPT too as well. So um, one important thing that we have to look at is that climate change is evident, it's clear, and it is happening. But for, for us to mitigate it, there's a need to increase yield. 
And if we are to increase yield, so there must be increase in the nutrients in the soil. And if you are going to increase in the increase in the nutrients in the soil, there's a big challenge. There's the environmental challenge, the residual effect of of the, the, the chemical fertilizers that are being used. Um, they contribute to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, they increase the burden on the use of fresh water also, especially for rice. Rice uses a lot of water. So there's a, there's, it's going to be competing with the, the, the water usage by a human being for fresh water. Now, we carried out the preliminary re research on the newest, and that is the one that has the triple gene. What we have gotten is that we got a better result even than the one with the single gene because it combines it. Our, our, our events are giving us up to almost 30% yield from 26 to 20, 27% in terms of, of result because of combining these different threads together. We show under this condition, you can use um, low fertilizer, low level of fertilizer, you can use low water, and you can produce rice. And that is the effect of rain-fed environment. That is why the production in Africa is low, because we depend on rain. And when rain is not enough, the production goes down. Apart from developing the product, there is a need to enhance the capacity of the people that are involved. So this has really helped us to actually build the capacity of scientists across Africa, Nigeria in particular. So we have, we have trained people on our, our scientists in Nigeria. They are more than capable. The scientists from NCRI are more than capable to carry out research and to develop the farmer preferred uh, uh, NUE and new health varieties in Nigeria. We are strengthening their capacity on that. And uh, we are strengthening their capacity also on how to test and carry out different research activities that is needed for that. This, there is the group you are seeing on the left here are people that are trained in US for on how to develop their own. So now Nigeria can develop its own um, nitrogen use efficient or any other transgenic um, rice for that matter. And also carrying out the trials and every regulatory trial. So there's nothing to worry about whether they are going to be able to do it or not. The capacity has actually been developed. And the development of capacity does not just stay at, at that because there's, there's, there's always a lot of dividend of technology adoption. Because Nigeria is adopting, through the, through the support of USID, ATF has been able to put in, in a facility that is what uh, about is quite awesome, more than about 150 million naira into facility and structure building. Right now, shelter for us to be able to test the water use efficient and even farmhouses, the CFT that we have put in that place. When um, DG Rufus visited the place, he said this is a state of the heart facility in Africa. It's one of actually the CFT facility in Nigeria is one of the best CFT facility in Sub Saharan Africa. The um, uh, newest rice here. In Nigeria. This is part of the contributing when it was being operated in 20 feet. Director of, um, of NCRI inspecting the, uh, the site. You can see uh, Dr. Rufus Edeba visiting for activities. Now, the project timeline is that we are already conducting the regulatory trials, which we have concluded the first. So the second set is going to be concluded by the end of this year, and then we have the uh, dossier ready for submission and submitted in 2021. We are trusting that by 2021, we will have uh, uh, the, 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 the product commercially released, and then we have the integrated product almost in market. Apart from that, for me to conclude, I want us to understand one thing, that the outcome of this Product is not just that it's going to lower um, at the small older farmer to lower the amount of fertilizer the input they need, so it's going to reduce the cost of production. And when it reduces the cost of production, this will lead to the uh, cost of local rice being competitive with the cost of imported rice because that's has been a very big challenge. It's going to reduce the nitrogen runoff and emission that goes into our our waters, and then it's going to reduce the nitrous oxide, which is one of the 
uh, potential greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, that contribute to global warming. So it's, this project is contributing to climate reduction of, uh, of, of global, global warming. And, uh, and for the other part is for the low input farmer, it's going to continue to lower their, their fertilizer application and increase their yield by at least 20%. So, and reduce the negative impact, the magnitude of the negative impact on the, on the, on the environment. Um, I think that is the end of the, the presentation. Thank you very much. And I, I'll be glad to receive questions thereafter. Thank you very much.